FanDuel has released their NBA win total over unders, and the Sacramento Kings are easy money. Alan Styles from Sackdown Sports 1140 joins me to break down why, plus the keys to the Kings winning 50 games or more this season. It's all right here on Locked on Kings. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked On Kings. And welcome to Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all offseason long. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. We are in the middle of the driest part of the sports calendar, at least basketball-wise. Thankfully, we have Olympic basketball to carry us through. But all summer long, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports anchor and reporter for ABC 10 News. And speaking of FanDuel, they're going to be a a focus of today's podcast because they released their win totals for all of the NBA teams. You can go onto FanDuel right now and you can bet whether each team is going to win more or less than the set number of games for every single team. And the Sacramento Kings are at 46 and a half wins. So essentially you're betting for the Kings to win more games than they won last season because they won 46 last season or the same to fewer games than last season. Easy money, easy, easy money. The Kings are going to win more games than they won last season, right? Barring injury like that, that can always happen. And of course there's no insurance policy for stuff like this. Like if, if, if you bet that the Kings are going to win more and they are decimated by injuries, then you're, you're SOL, right? Um, but that's, I don't think that's going to happen. And I, I'm not living scared. There's no reason to believe that this Kings team is going to be decimated by injuries. So I think over 46 and a half wins is absolute easy money. But instead of just talking about it by myself, I thought I'd bring in a, a, a buddy of mine. You hear him uh, on Sacktown Sports 1140 radio uh, on the Styles and Watkins show. Alan Styles joins me here on Locked on Kings. Over the years, the Sacramento Kings have borrowed or taken a lot from the Bay. There's Mike Malone. There's Mike Brown. And now in some capacity over the last two years, there was Alan Styles going from the Bay to Sacramento radio. He's ours now. And now look at the Bay. Now look at the Warriors taking back from the Kings, going out and getting Buddy healed. So see, it all comes it all comes back around. Alan Styles back here with me on the Locked on Kings podcast. It's been a little bit, my friend. Of course, the host of Styles and Watkins, or one of the hosts of Styles and Watkins, mm-hmm. which you can catch middays on on Sacktown Sports 1140. Alan, how are you uh, making it through the driest, deadest, most awful part of the sports calendar for content, my guy? Man, it, it's definitely rough as far as the Kings are concerned. Thank you for having me on, Matt. I think t- on today's show, I went so deep. I found, I think it was on fadeawayworld.com. They had a four-team trade with the Wizards, the Heat, the the... Kings and the Knicks, right? Okay. And the Kings got Kyle Kuzma. And I think the Wizards or someone got Kevin Herter and, and Devin Carter. So that, that's where we're at right now. That's okay. where we're at right now. But you're right. It's definitely dry. We're almost through it. At least we got Olympics to kind of to kind of hold us through. But we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Well, for the record, I'd say no to that deal, but that's that's that, that's just me at this point in time. But that's not what we're talking about. In in true off-season content fashion, we're all waiting for the NBA schedule to drop. That's like the next big thing. And then in in awful but wonderful content fashion, we dissect an NBA schedule like we can predict what the hell is going to happen. Yeah. But before that even, FanDuel, who's a wonderful sponsor here of the Locked On Podcast Network, They dropped their over-under win totals for every single NBA team. As you can imagine, the Boston Celtics are the highest with 58.5. The Oklahoma City Thunder right under them at 56.5. The Sacramento Kings are right in the middle of the pack. In fact, they're second in the Pacific Division with the over-under set at 46.5 
games. So essentially, are they going to beat last year's 46 win total or right. are they not? Yeah. Alan, call me cocky. Call me a dumb gambler. I think that's easy money. I think, I think it's easy that. cheese. I, I don't see how it's not easy cheese, barring some type of injury similar to this season. But I mean, when you add it up, Matt, you have some of some some bad losses. And I think that's what DeMar DeRozan is going to fix. When you couldn't turn the faucet off and it was just three ball central and the threes weren't falling, you have somebody and everyone can talk about the spacing, but you have a bucket right there. You have De'Aaron Fox, you had Malik Monk, but it was tough because sometimes they play together. Sometimes you don't know if it's De'Aaron Fox time or Malik Monk time. And and as far as Malik Monk is concerned, he can get to the cup, but he shoots the three ball too. So you really didn't have someone to stop that bleeding. And that's what you have with DeMar DeRozan. So I think right there, some of the bad losses, let, let's just take away three of those bad losses. I have the Blazers, the Hornets, and the Pistons. You take those three away right there. Okay, so you take those three away. Now you're already at 49, right, or 48, whatever you want to call it. And then after that, you still have all the games with Malik Monk and Kevin Herter injured at the end of the season. So you had an ice-cold Kevin Herter all season long. Then he got injured, and then you had Malik Monk who got flopped on by your boy Luka Doncic, and he didn't end the season. So to me, it's very – the Kings didn't even take care of business and they fell into 46 wins. So I don't really see how they're not going to get to 46. It, it, meanwhile, it was the healthiest Western conference we've seen in a very long time. I mean, that Western conference, somebody is taking a step back, whether it's a team that was right behind the, 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 the Kings or a little bit in front of the Kings. So that's why I don't think that this is even going to be close, really. And you're still – the Clippers are exiting the chat. They, they have worse odds. Mm -hmm. Then you have the – maybe the Timberwolves continue to stay hot. And OKC, okay, me personally, Matt, not that high on the Nuggets. I think they had a terrible offseason. And I'm not, I'm not saying that the Kings will finish in front of them. But there are certain teams that are – those are two, two teams right there that are, that are going to take a step back. So I think 46 and a half is easy. So I mentioned the Kings are second in the Pacific Division with the highest over-under win total in the Pacific uh, here on FanDuel. Number one team is the Phoenix Suns, but only one game better at 47 and a half. But here's what's crazy to me, Alan, drifting away from the Kings a little bit. The Memphis Grizzlies are also set at 47 and a half games. Yeah. I don't know how much of a believer that we should be in the Memphis Grizzlies, I understand yeah. if John Morant plays the full season, they're a significantly better team than they were last year with everything that they had to deal with. Right. But I'm I I maybe I'm just prematurely setting the sun on the Memphis Grizzlies. I think their window is closed. They're gonna be a good team, but in the state of the Western Conference, I'll take the Kings and stack up their roster against the, the uh Grizzlies any day of the week. Well, it's interesting, and I've been I've been on the side of the Grizzlies aren't done, but I think where the Grizzlies are at they're at a point where it's actually pretty similar to the King. So you basically sold the whole season because of the injury. So you can't then sell the season and go out and make acquisitions because you don't know what's mm -hmm. wrong, right? So they basically have to do what the Kings did last season and say, hey, we have to see what we have with this. So this season, I think is that's what it's going to be. I've had a lot of conversations on the show and debates really about John ja Morant versus De'Aaron Fox. Obviously, mm -hmm. De'Aaron a little bit older. You, you, I would take De'Aaron right now. Is it possible John ja Morant eventually has a higher ceiling? Maybe. But the one thing I will say about the Grizzlies is that, Matt, they're really young. I mean, they're, they're, they're just now getting to the 24s and 25s. So I wouldn't count them out yet. I don't think, to your point, to keep it to this season, I don't see them – being a three seed or anything like they were prior to Ja getting hurt, because I think that a lot of other teams got better and the Grizzlies, they basically have to figure out, okay, where are we at? We give Desmond Bain all this money. We have Ja Morant. We still have, you know what I mean? JJJ. We still have all these guys and Gigi Jackson's really good as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that they'll be much better and, and maybe they're a, a five seed, something like that, which I guess could put you in that realm of between 46 and 50. But yeah, I, I don't see them blowing 47 and a half out of the water. It's possible they get there. I think that's the thing. The Grizzlies don't even know. They don't even know. The Pelicans are one game 
behind the Kings in this these FanDuel win uh, total over-unders at 45 and a half. And then the rest of the Pacific Division, you have the Lakers and Warriors both at 43 and a half. And the Clippers, like you mentioned, you said they've entered the or exited the chat. They're at 40 and a half. So FanDuel's just looking to see if the Clippers can get over 500. Right. When you look at those three teams in the Pacific, I understand why Phoenix is above Sacramento on paper. That is supposed to be the best team in the division. That's They're supposed to be one of the best teams in the Western Conference. They're supposed right. to be one of the best teams in the league, period. If you have right. Durant, who's been playing out of his mind uh, in, in the Olympics, as expected, uh, you have, of course, Booker, Beal. If that team can stay healthy, we know what they Ad can do. Jones, who they sure. got on a discount. 100% too. Like that is a, there's a massive if with that team, which is their ability to stay healthy. Durant played over 70 games last season. Is he going to do that again? Yeah. So I, I'm okay with them at the top. The rest of the Pacific though, the Pacific division is essentially loaded with teams that are all yesterday's teams. And what I mean by that is they're kind of holding on to the, past generation that is loaded with first ballot hall of famers, right? These Mm -hmm. guys are legends, but the, the torch has been passed to the next generation. The torch has been passed to the ant Edwards, the Shea Mm -hmm. Gilgis Alexander's to the Lucas to all that. They're holding on to that last bit of the old generation for dear life. How much of a believer are you in golden state and the Lakers and the Clippers and their ability to compete with, where the Sacramento Kings expect to be or should be. Yeah, and you're trying to get me in trouble here talking Warriors. Nope. So I'm going to be very careful. I'm going to be Innocent. very careful. But I'll say this. I was very surprised the the Warriors didn't go all in and go desperation mode for Lloyd Market. And now that he's off the map, and actually today on the show, we talked with the Nets writer. The Nets are in the driver's seat. So unless somebody's going to overpay, and this still does include the Kings, for Dorian Finney-Smith or Cam Johnson, everybody wants a Cam Johnson now. And yep. the Nets, according to the writer C.J. Holmes, they have so many picks. They don't have to rush into anything. He thinks it's going to be more of a trade deadline thing. Mm-hmm. So who is going to basically stumble out the gate and get desperate? And with that being said, that could be the Warriors. I mean, I'm not that high on, on Brandon Pajemski. There were conflicting reports as to was Kaminga involved or not. But as far as we know, Pajemski was the – hey, we're not moving with that. And that it's pretty ridiculous that the Warriors are going in that direction. I, I don't see them overcoming. I think they got better. I think Clay had a rough rough season. And you add who you added in slow-mo and DeAnthony Melton and Buddy Heald. But I don't see them, I don't see them doing much better. I, I think their ceiling is a five seed. I think their ceiling is a five seed. And I don't see them getting there. Lakers in a similar spot. They might get desperate. There was a Laker article or anonymous anonymous source saying that Jeremy Grant asking for whatever the Blazers are asking for it's ridiculous the two first rounders when that's not even what the Blazers got him for mm-hmm. Jeremy Grant came out and basically said he's very comfortable in Portland and people don't even know how much better Jeremy Grant would make really any team but specifically the Lakers I know they have that big two one of the best duos in the NBA but I, I don't know what the Lakers are going to do pray that Rui Hachimura becomes who he's been in the Olympics and that Austin Reeves who they made untouchable by the way turns out to be t- turns out to be next level these teams just make these by the way these teams just make these these players untouchable so quickly I'm just not sure why I don't know why they do that and then last but not least you have the Clippers and Steve Ballmer trying to in- open the into a dome and you know he's really excited about that but Kawhi played the most regular season games he's played in a very long time I'm not betting on that back-to-back. I am not betting on that happening back-to-back. They lose Paul George. They're like the land of misfit toys. I mean, you have Derek Jones Jr. You have Norman Powell. You have you have a bunch of pieces that would be really good to finish off a contender. But together, I don't think they're really doing too much. I saw something saying that the Clippers might be interested in a Julius Randle just to try to get another score on the team. Sure, maybe. I don't I don't know what they would have to give to the Knicks. They, I don't know what the Knicks want to do with Julius Randle. He didn't go to Villanova, so they might want to get, get rid of him. But, yeah, I'm not big believers in any of those three teams. The only team I could see getting desperate, all those Warrior reports, is that they feel comfortable and they're going to make smaller-scale deals. So I, I think it would be the Lakers. I just think they go in. A name we haven't heard a, about a lot is a Trey Young. The, what in the world are the Hawks doing? Right. I don't think they know. So you go out and get a Trey Young that puts you in, I, I would say, fourth seed, 
you know, area again with the Austin Reeves balling out and, and they had Gabe Vincent and a bunch of guys that just couldn't be healthy all season. So I think if you are a Lakers fan, you could argue and, and uh, warrior fans can say the same thing about Draymond, even though that was self-inflicted. I think if you're a Lakers fan, you could say, Hey, we never got to see who we are or who we wanted to be or thought we could be because of injury. The Clippers, it doesn't matter. And the Warriors, you could argue with Draymond, but Draymond is just a year older and you lost some pieces too. So I don't really believe in any of them, but I would believe crazy enough in the Lakers the most. You heard it here first. Alan Styles thinks the Warriors are cooked. That is what I took away from that. <laughs> You heard it on Locked On Kings, everybody. Book and now they're gonna now you're gonna jinx it. They're gonna go get Cam Johnson today because you said that. Not gonna happen. Send it to your Warrior fans. Al, uh, Alan Styles thinks the Warriors are cooked. Today's episode of the Locked On Kings podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. When your schedule is packed with kids' activities, big work projects, all the things in life, it's easy to let your priorities slip. Even when we know it makes us happy. It's hard to make time for the things that we enjoy or the things that we need to take care of ourselves. But when you feel like you have no time to yourself, non-negotiables like therapy are more important than ever. If you're thinking about giving therapy a try or if you've considered therapy at all, take my word for it. I highly encourage you to do it. Therapy was life-changing for me and has been life-changing for me. It's something that I started during the pandemic, have been continuing uh, continuing regularly. It's something that initially I was not a fan of, right? I was like, okay, I, I don't need therapy. I don't have a big, big enough problems for therapy. And I think that's how most of us feel. People feel like, oh, you have to have extreme issues or depression or, or, or a, a loss in the family or very bad um, relationship issues in order for therapy to be a thing. That's not the case at all. We all carry our own baggage. Life gets to all of us. We all need somebody to talk to to work through it. If you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, designed to be flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you do is fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Never skip therapy day. It's like leg day. Never skip it with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H E L P.com slash locked on NBA. Shifting back to the Kings in all, in all seriousness, one of the, I think one of the measuring sticks for the Kings this year, one of the goals that they have to accomplish, the obvious goal is make it back to the playoffs, but yes. there's, there's a number of wins that gets them there. I think without concern and that's yeah. 50, like that 50 win total. And that's a number that the Kings themselves have brought up. Mike Brown has brought up like good teams, uh, like great teams, typically championship contenders are winning at least 50 games. Right. So that 50 win total, I think is the, the, the focus or the goal or the expectation for the Sacramento Kings. What would you say, like, there's a bunch of factors to this, but if you were to say like the biggest key to the Sacramento Kings winning 50 games is fill in the blank. Yeah, I, I would say the, the biggest key and I'm torn here, but I would say the biggest key would have to be Keegan Murray returning to his three point form. Okay. I think that Keegan Murray, a lot of people, and I'm not really sure where you were on this map, but a lot of people, we saw some ESPN writers talk about, oh, well, his runway is going to be messed up. I'm just not of the belief, to be honest, as respectfully as possible. You know, they, they say in the league, they're guys that have specific roles and guys that can just do everything. And I think there are some Kings fans that, that think that Keegan could be that do everything guy. I'm not one of those guys. That's not to say I don't think he could be elite at what he does, but I honestly think that this might help Keegan Murray because it it forces his hand into being, I'm going to defend at an elite level, right? I'm going to shoot the basketball at an elite level from three. I'm still going to learn how to get to the cup and distribute a little bit, but this season we saw too much of Keegan Murray trying to do a bunch of different things offensively. I think bringing in DeRozan Keegan has to be that. Now, he might get a couple grenades that he has to figure out. Hey, you know what I mean? I'm going to get the ball with two seconds on the shot clock here. But I think it's Keegan Murray returning to form from three-point land. That is what could get them to the 50 wins. But that's a really tough question. You could go in about 15 um, different directions. That's why it's a great podcast question because we, right. we can literally go wherever we want. And we can layer it on top of each other. But let's stick with Keegan a little bit because for me – like I think the Kings still are hoping and wanting Keegan to show his capabilities as a three level scorer. I mean, that's the, if, if he has the ability to reach the all-star potential that they believe he had 
when they drafted him and they believe he still has the the uptick of defense certainly helps with that but we know you don't typically get into an all-star game via defense alone unless you're drew holiday and you're playing defense for the best team in the league sure. uh that being said the kings want keegan to be a three-level scorer mm -hmm. they no longer need him to be at least right for this upcoming season. And I remember thinking back to this time last year, maybe a little bit later than this time last year, Monty McNair does an article or does an interview with the athletic. I think it was Whoa. Slater that put it out or he's either Amick or Slater. And they put out this article and it, it was an interview with Monty. And one of the things Monty said in the article is he talks about Keegan. They're looking for Keegan to make a jump offensively. They were yeah. hoping that what we saw in the summer league and the Cali classic that summer was oh. going to somewhat translate to the NBA. Exactly. And really, as much as we were hoping for it too, and I was talking about it a lot here on Locked on Kings at the time too, the Kings were putting a lot of their eggs in that basket of if our offense is going to improve on already being one of the best in NBA history at the time, mm -hmm. it's going to be Keegan. Yeah. And then they started asking more from Kevin Herter as a defender, and they started asking more from De'Aaron Fox in one way, and started asking for more for... I think it was last season was a lot of, we like what we're doing. Let's try and add on top of that. And you figured out which guys could handle that adding more and which guys couldn't. I think yeah. Keegan can handle being more of a three level score offensively. He also took on a lot on the defensive end and handled that well too. But mm -hmm. now at this point, the Kings don't need Keegan to be that guy to have anybody be a mid-range threat not need, named De'Aaron Fox. I think that's what you kind of touched on earlier in the podcast. Sacramento now has someone that can go out and get them a bucket who Keegan right. can also learn from and work with every single day this season if he wants to. There's, there's no way, going back to those ESPN writers and those people that thought it was a negative move, there's no way the addition of DeMar DeRozan is a bad thing for Keegan Murray. It just no. makes sense. No, and I would and I, I would probably assume that when they talk about Keegan Murray and they have the 25 under 25 list, it's not like they have Keegan Murray in the top five or sure. top 10. And this is this is completely going to derail Keegan Murray. Sure. I mean, I think a lot of people are still trying to figure out what Keegan Murray was going to be. One, one comparison that I've been putting out, Matt, is is Michael Porter Jr. Now, I do think that Keegan could ultimately be a better all around player. But Michael Porter Jr., we know he had the injuries, mm -hmm. but he was supposed to be a straight-up baller. He gets mm -hmm. to the Nuggets, and they needed him to play a role. Mm -hmm. Did it end up maybe hindering who he will ultimately be as a player in the league? Maybe, but he's an elite shooter, okay, On and he was on a championship team. So I think you have to make decisions. So as the old saying goes, jack of all trades, master of none, I don't know, and maybe we'll never know, with the addition of DeRozan, if Keegan was really going to be a master of all trades, but those guys, they don't come around very often. And right. me personally, I didn't see that in Keegan Murray, but that's not to say, I mean, Clay Thompson is going to go to the hall of fame. He's not, he's not one of those guys, Clay Thompson. He's going to shoot the three ball. He's one of the best shooters of all time, but he's going to shoot the three ball and defend right mm -hmm. before injury. That's what he did. So I just don't think, I think everybody wants a dude that's just going to do everything but how many how many hits do you think a team is going to have? If you think that Deer and Fox is a dude, then you already got your dude. And most teams, they only have one of them. They don't they don't just pop up. Oh, we happen to draft two. And if you wanted to go there, some would argue Tyrese Halliburton. So the chances that the Kings drafted three all all around dudes that will be future All Stars, the numbers don't say that that's that's the reality. Even drafting two in De'Aaron Fox and Tyrese Halliburton, that's pretty darn good. But now you're saying this guy as well. I just I don't think that was ever going to be the case regardless of – you don't want a Harrison Barnes situation mm -hmm. where I called Harrison Barnes, and all respect to Harrison Barnes. We love Harrison Barnes. Good luck to him. I've always called him, and I think you know this, a dull Swiss Army knife. He does a little bit of everything, but not at a high level. And mm -hmm. I don't think we wanted that with Keegan Murray. I'd rather him be – you walk into the court, you know what your job is. And with DeMar DeRozan, he now knows that. We're talking about them so much in this episode. By now, you know that Locked on Kings is brought to you by FanDuel. We all love sports so much. We never want them to stop. We wish the NBA season could be year round. Right now, we're killing time. We got baseball to try and carry us through in the Olympics too, but we're killing time before the start of football season, which helps us kill time before the start of the NBA season. And FanDuel can help you kill even more time and keep that sports fix going whenever you want 
all summer long. All you have to do is log into the app and dream up bets anytime that you're in the mood. FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. So it's always fresh and fun, and there's different ways to play. So head to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer and hand to fit, hand, uh, head to FanDuel.com right now and take the over on that Sacramento Kings 46 and a half win total. FanDuel is an official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Another key, or maybe the key that I guess I'll, I'll present as an answer to, to the breaking the 50 win threshold crush question. I think this Kings team just in general has to be better at home. They've got 20, they were 24 and 17 last season, I believe. Yeah, 24 uh, and 17 at home last season. The season before, when they won 48 games, they were 23 and 18. Now that's above 500. That's a yeah. good record. But the eye test will tell you that the Sacramento Kings did not play their best basketball at home. In fact, no. the eye test will show you the Kings look the best typically on the road, even though their road re records were overall worse. They only had two more road uh, home wins than they had road wins, which mm -hmm. to some extent, that's a good thing. That's a positive. If you can win on the road, you're probably going to be a good team. But the Sacramento Kings, if they're going to be a 50-win team, if they're going to be a legitimate championship contender or turn into that, they have to be a team that is feared at home. They yeah. already got the environment. They got the building. They got the volume. They got the fan base. They have everything at home to be successful except for the consistency. And mm -hmm. I don't understand why this team struggles to be so consistent at home. Mike Brown has talked about it before and he's joked, but also not joked. And he's not blaming the fans here, but he said like, we kind of rely maybe too much on the energy of the fans yeah. and don't create our own energy as much as we need to. And as much as they do on the road, some of these guys like Malik Monk seem to thrive off of the, animosity on the road yeah. and shutting people up rather than making people cheer. So I guess it's just how you're wired, but the Kings to me need to be a team that every time they step on their home floor in the golden one center, it doesn't matter who they're playing, whether it's the Detroit Pistons or the Boston Celtics, they need to be expected to win. And if they lose, it's going to happen. Bad losses at home are going to happen, but you need to be expected to win every time you take your home floor, because that's true home court advantage. This team hasn't had that for two years. No. And I mean, the, the Mike Brown thing, I think that's really funny because you, I know he's just joking, but you want the fans to not be as loud. I mean, I, I think part of this is the same way you said Malik Monk likes to, you know, shut people up on the road. I think teams do come in here and I know I got in trouble. I know this is how we started off on the wrong foot here, but I do think that they come in other play other teams. This is no excuse but they don't want to hear golden one going off and they don't want that beam lit. I mean, Rosen I, I think, said the same thing. Yeah. Rosen. Like pe people have said that before. So the Kings, they got to find a way to overcome that because you're right, Matt, wasn't there, I don't want to say inside joke, but wasn't there basically something going on where the Kings, every time they would come back from a road trip, they just lay an egg that first game at home. And yeah. we'd be thinking, Finally, they're back home. They can get back on the winning side of things. And there were some bad losses. I know one, I think this was their first game returning. They had the DeMar DeRozan situation, who we don't talk about. They lost to a bad Bulls team, and DeMar DeRozan balled out. And we can call it – And we, they're the really bad losses, and then they're the losses like that one that we don't talk about. There's the Heat game where they were missing everyone, mm -hmm. and it was, uh, it, it was Duncan Robinson running the point, and everyone just said, it's Heat culture that happens. But – Stuff like that can't happen. Mm -hmm. You can't lose to that Bulls team. You cannot lose to that Heat team. And some and, and some of these bad losses. I mean, the teams. The other thing that about the about the fifty wins is you got to find a way to leave with something. You know, I played baseball back in the day. You go one for five, right? And it's not a good day. You're not. You didn't hit three hundred on the day, but you left with something. You cannot lose every game to the New Orleans Pelicans. You can't get blanked by a team. The yeah. Rockets were another team that they really struggled with. You have to leave with – you can't just say – we got to the point where, okay, just say uncle against the Rockets, say uncle against the Pelicans. You can't do that if you want to get to 50 wins. I, mm -hmm. I, I know it's, it might sound silly, but you got to get one. You, you, mm -hmm. you have to get one in these – because that's why the 47 and a half to me or 46 and a half is easy cheese. Because there were situations where they couldn't even get one, right? And you got to think that they will be better. So you have the blowouts or the, the bad games against bad teams. You have the injury games when Malik Monk and Kevin Herter were injured. And then you had games like that where 
they just they just didn't have it. So all you have to do, I mean, we're talking about two, just two games to get it over. But to get to 50, I still think they can get there. I, I believed it throughout the season. And then it just went that that stretch after Malik got hurt. And then the Suns came to town. There are games that you're supposed to win. You have to win those. Then the problem last season, they had games that they were supposed to win that they lost. And they had games that it would be really nice if they won. And they lost those two. And they still got the 46 and a half. So I think 50 is definitely possible. But yeah, the home court advantage thing, it's it's really confusing. I, I don't get it. I don't get it. And you don't want to acknowledge it. I feel like Mike Brown, I mean, there's really not, like I said, who are you going to tell him to cheer, cheer less? What, what do you do? You're, you got home cooked meals. De'Aaron's getting those tacos. I mean, you should be good to go. You should be good to go. Yeah, from mid-December to mid-January, these are some of the home games from last season. They lost to Boston on December 20th, 144 to 119. That was the ass-kicking, and that was the night that Keon Ellis took the podium for the first time. Um, and, and weren't they missing Tatum? Or it was it was only Brown. I think they were missing Tatum. Let's see. Let me double check. I can look. Yeah, Jalen Brown had 28 to lead, and correct, Tatum did not play. Terrible. Tatum did not play, and you you got your absolutely you got absolutely wiped by the NBA champs. You beat Phoenix the next game at home, one twenty to one hundred five. That was like the only time they beat Phoenix and actually held on to a lead. You lost to Minnesota, one ten to ninety eight. You lost to Charlotte, one eleven to one hundred four. Uh, you beat Orlando in double overtime, barely beat Orlando in that game. Right. You beat Toronto by five. You lost to New Orleans, one thirty three to one hundred. Ugh. Uh, and then you lost to Indiana 126 to 121. That is mid-December through mid-January. The majority of those games, not just losses, losses via beatdown. Like those are the things you have to clean up in your own building. That Indiana game, wasn't that the Buddy Heald game and Tyrese Halliburton in that ridiculous outfit? Tyrese didn't play. Tyrese Pascal didn't play. Siakam didn't play. Yep. Benedict Matherin scored 25 to lead him in scoring and TJ McConnell looked unguardable. He had 20 and 10, 20 points, 10 assists, shot nine of 14 from the field. That's what I'm talking about. You got to think that having DeRozan for all, for, for everything else that he's going to bring, there's just a leadership aspect that, and he said himself, I mean, he talked so much during his presser about his introductory press conference about wanting to get back to winning. He he's that struggled with the Spurs, struggled with the Bulls. So it's just got to be a point where this is his last hoorah in mm. what's left of his prime. He just turned 35 yesterday. So I think there's going to be a common goal that you can't lose games like that if you want to play relevant basketball in, in May and beyond. Well, last one for you, Alan. We so we got the key, the my key defending at home or or like defending home court, winning at home more, your key involving. Keegan Murray and, and him getting back to his, his three point threshold. Of course we have to work De'Aaron Fox into the mix too. There again, we can go a million directions with this and spend a whole hour on this topic alone. You could talk about Tamanda Sabonis and, and what can he follow up from last season? How much better can he get from last season? Does he even have to get better? De'Aaron Fox for me is, is so massive because we have our eye on, I did my last podcast on this. This is not a contract year, but it's kind of a contract year because this is the first year where he's eligible to actually earn a Supermax contract by making right. an All-NBA team. Had a conversation with uh, with my partner, Kevin John, about this. The What has to happen for him to make an All-NBA team? He's not making it the same way again. He's not making it by the Kings just winning. Like He has to be a 30 points per game score. He has to put himself, cement himself amongst the best in the league. He has to put himself in that Jalen Brunson or Shea Gilgis Alexander category in the yeah. eyes of the voters and in the eyes of the league. But you also have to win on top of that. Now, thankfully, mm -hmm. things go hand in hand. I think if, if the Kings are winning 50 games, it's because Fox is playing really, really well. Right. What are your expectations? And again, we'll wrap with this. Your expectations of just De'Aaron and being on a contract year. I think he, he we know he's winning motivated. I think he's also pretty motivated by that by that Supermax contract. Hence the yes. reason he's turned down two contract extensions by the Kings already to this point. Yeah. What are you expecting from De'Aaron next season? Yeah. And that, you know, he, that's why that's part of the reason we all thought Malik was going to leave because De'Aaron said, go get the bag. Right. Mm -hmm. And Malik said, I actually want to stay and, and, and play with you guys. So for me, I think it's simple. And it's funny you bring this up because I just talked about this yesterday. How close do you think De'Aaron Fox is to his ceiling? And personally, I said, I think he's about 70%. Yeah, I, I think he's about 70 percent. And that's not to say that every player gets to their ceiling, but I think sure. he's about 70 percent away. 
you you kind of highballed it, Matt, and and said thirty a game. We've well, seen that thirty or twenty six this season. I, I, that would be nice if you can get to thirty. That that would be really nice. I'm looking at you add, you know, three to four points on your your points per game. All right, I'm going to bring up the free throws. You have to get to 80% mm-hmm. as a free throw shooter. And if you look at his three-point percentages, he's never shot this high. He was right under 37%, but it was 32, 29, 34, 28. So can you have? Can you even stay at 37%? Or Obviously, we'd love him to get better, but can you even stay at 30, 36.9 or 7, whatever it was, for two seasons in a row? Yep. If you do that, then I think you're really close to getting the big money. If he gets to, to 30, then I definitely think he is. Am I expecting him to do that? I think this is it, man. Eighth season in the in the league. And like you said, you're talking, Matt, and you bring up Jalen Brunson. Every single year, another point guard is entering the chat, mm-hmm. and they're getting brought up on, on – and like you said, the, these writers, national shows and things like that. And we can talk about how – Oh, Sacramento this and Sacramento that. The numbers are the numbers. And De'Aaron is just playing in the golden era of point guards right now. Yep. So I don't think it's as much about people hating on De'Aaron as it is the numbers are the numbers. And yep. you can talk about usage rates and things like that. But if all the other point guards around De'Aaron are sitting at 29 or 30 plus per game and he's at 27, we can sit there and say, oh, he's better than next season or last season. But that doesn't matter. Yeah. So I think he will be better because he's shown – I think his points per game will go up. I don't know, especially with DeRozan, if, it, if it's going to go up by four mm-hmm. to get to 30. I think more realistic would be two, and hopefully he gets those free throws up. So I'm looking for 28 points per game. Realistically, I'm looking at 28 points per game. I think he was at 73% from free throw. I mean, can you get to 79? Can you get to 80? So 28 points per game, 80% from free throw, and just stay at that high 36%. And he's probably going to be right there on the fringe. I don't think it's going to be a done deal, even if they get to 50 games. It depends on if Keegan Murray's balling out, they could get to 50 games. And it's not solely because of De'Aaron and De'Aaron – having those numbers. So I think he'll be better, but I don't know if I see 30 points per game. And I hope I'm wrong, by the way. The, I hope numbers, the numbers you put out there, though, you better hope you're a top two seed. I don't even think maybe top three seed might not be enough. Again, you're not getting in. Again, you already got your surprise vote. You already yeah. got in. Not to say that he and D- Sabonis didn't both deserve to be all NBA that year, because they did. But you mm-hmm. barely got all NBA third team, and you got it because the Kings went from zero to hero in one right. season. Right. right. You can't, you're, you're not getting that again. So again, maybe I'm calling for too much and asking for too much and expecting too much. But again, if Fox is motivated by making an all NBA team as a point guard in a, in an era of so many talented scoring guards around the league, again, it's there. I know it's positionless now, which makes it harder for him. He's also got to compete with everybody in the league, not just the Western right. conference to make all NBA, right? You have to be a top 15 player period. I don't know how De'Aaron Fox accomplishes that without scoring 30 points a game. I just don't. Because as long as Sabonis is on this team, Sabonis is going to put up the numbers that puts him in the conversation. Sure. If if you're doing the 27, 28 points per game, like you said, the Kings have to be so good that they're a top two seed that you almost have to put two guys in there again. But people are also going to take that scenario and use that argument against De'Aaron. Well, they added DeMar, Keegan got better, Malik did this, Sabonis did that. There's all these reasons for why people are going to stack the de- deck against Fox and he's not going to make that all NBA as a guard when he's going up against Jalen Brunson, for example, or Shea Gilgis Alexander, for example, who are very clearly the dudes on sure. their team. And Fox is absolutely the dude here in Sacramento, but he has not done what Jalen Brunson did last season enough he's not done what Shea Gilgis Alexander did last season enough and when he has done it to be fair he has not gotten the attention and the respect that it deserves and I'll kingpin that and 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 go to war for him on that side of things but I mean I agree with you Fox needs to do more and he needs to play at a level where he is undeniably in that conversation that that is the the position that he has not put himself in yet, or he has not gotten to yet that 
You talk about 70%. I think we all know, Mike Brown has even said, we know he's capable of. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you hit the nail right on the head. I, the only thing that I'll add is ultimately what De'Aaron Fox wants, he can he can do as much as he can to get there. Sure. But I'm, I'm just not sure that it's going to be enough because of everything you just laid out. I think that he's going to have opportunities. I also think this, Matt, and you can't go back right you can't go backwards in life but i also think that leaving the chat this last season and missing the playoffs with malik monk out and it might not be fair but i'm saying you also have to re-establish yourself in the conversation you had yeah. no john morant yeah. okay and you can we can joke about nba 2k ratings and things like that but it, it reflects what people think it really does yeah. and john morant is ranked higher than than De'Aaron fox a lot of people like Josh, so he's back in uh, you know for as uh, as long as he is barring any issues or injuries so that's another guy you add back in that you didn't even have to deal with last season you had an opportunity to at least make it a building block for this season to just get in and he didn't get in or they didn't get in and that's fine all i'm saying is you have to be so good that you have to remind people people don't care about the beam team a couple years ago that that was fun that was cute they don't i think the one thing that he does have going for them or for him, is that a lot of people don't love the DeMar DeRozan move. And I know they're going to move the goalposts on Sacramento. I get it. But you do have that to go back to. Hey, we we gave – I saw on CBS Sports, somebody gave the Kings a D. I saw on ESPN, both teams – when's the last time you saw both teams lose a trade? They, they said that the Bulls lost a trade and the Kings. I've never <laughs> seen that before. Those so, are idiots. They're idiots. So, so he can use that. And assuming DeMar doesn't score 30 a game, but he can use that and say, no, no, no. Y'all didn't think we could figure this out. DeMar played his part and I played mine and I elevated. So he can use that. Again. He can use the hate or the whatever against the national media, but the numbers are going to be the numbers. That's what this comes down to. Well, I can't wait to see what numbers he puts up, hopefully not just to start the season, but all season long next year. Alan, it's going to be exciting, especially once we get to training camp time. So we'll have to do this again, my friend. Keep up the great work over there at Sacktown Sports, and uh, we'll, we'll talk soon. Thanks for having me, Matt. As always, keep doing your thing. And you can find me, you see the, the, the title right under there, at the underscore styles files. Let's talk some kings. Let's do it. Take care, Matt.